So, welcome to Meta Society, and today we're going to be talking about our most favourite thing in the world, learning to read figures from reports. And what are the reports? They are the medical reports that you're going to read when you come across anything, okay? Apart from the people who say that COVID doesn't exist, okay? These are the things, these are the reports that are going to help you, which come up with your own conclusion. But the only issue is, they're complicated, they're a bit, bit hard to understand, okay? And sometimes they don't make sense to you when you read them, you just skip past them, you're like, I just want to read the information. But the graphs gives you the information. It's like an image saying a thousand words. Well, it's like this, right? A graph gives you a thousand words. So, let's begin. So, why do we present... Oh, sorry. So the question is, why do we present data graphically? And here is two images. Okay, so I want you to, um, as people, to cooperate and tell me which is raw and which is um, organized or presented or formatted. Go on. The top is raw, the bottom is organized, easy to understand. Yeah, exactly. And what other reasons why we present data graphically? Anybody know? Um, Go on. Oh, back, it's, yes. It's, it's easier to kind of differentiate between the different types of data and what they might mean. Yep, so good. Anything, anything else? Zaid? Oh, no, yes. Exactly, we, know, we do notice trends as well. Zay, do you want to say anything? Uh, as a year 13? Anyway, right. So, as again, raw and processed data, okay? So, the data here is very difficult to understand. See, this guy put three in, in words instead of a, a, a number, which is silly, right? Graphical data allows authors to summarize and communicate their findings. So if I found all of this, right, I can just say that in a format of that. I don't, I don't need all this data numbers, maybe I can't find a mean, I could put it into a graph. It allows us to interpret it. Oh, um, the BMI is increasing. I wouldn't understand that if I had that, you know, it would be a bit difficult. Large amounts of data can be converted into simpler data. And it keeps me interested. I don't care about this, I'm going to be bored if I see this because I'm not gonna understand what is going on. But if I see like some awesome trend, okay? If I see like something like obesity goes down within 20 years, that's kind of cool to see. It keeps me engaged. And it keep, allows me to begin reading the article and continuing, what did the author want to show me? Oh, okay, right. So, we're gonna have a little quiz. Oh my God, we have four quizzes to do. <laughs> so, here's a fake statement. The rate in, oh, and let me show you the things I want you to fix. So, the rate in which population was diagnosed with wing scapula in 1901 was 100, and in 1992 it was 120. How might an author organise this data? Go on. Not a bar graph. Anyone else? No a scatter graph. A what? text presentation, exactly, right? What information did I give you? I only give you two pieces of information. That and that. If I put it into a bar graph, it would be two bars. Come on. But do I have lots of data? I just have two pieces. Do you need lots of data to have a bar graph? Yes. What's the, what's, what's the point, what's the trend am I going to observe from here to here? I don't have an, I don't have an overall trend, I just have two years. To those two years are just 1991, 1992. You can make your own conclusion if you want to, but perhaps 1992 is an anomaly. All it is is just me stating it. So, text presentation. If I put it into a scatter graph, I'm gonna have two points, and we align. I'm like, what, what is this? There, there, is no, there is no correlation. It could be negative if it wants to be. If I add one more point, it'll be negative. It won't enhance or provide a new trend. As, as of again, right, you won't even interpret anything from it. If there was more data, then maybe it would be suitable. Then maybe uh, that kind of be useful, you know, maybe a scatter graph or a bar graph, not a pie chart. 
So, here's quiz number two. Anesthesia this sematized two new drugs, Ladanium and Saganium. They wanted to see what concentration of drugs are needed to ensure the patient falls asleep. So, here are the options again, okay? This is like pointless or some British TV show, okay? Which one would I use? Okay, that's one again. Not a bar graph. <laughs> Anyone else? Not a scatter graph. Box you just keep saying so scatter graph. It is a box chart. I use a box chart. Okay, so it's a bit confusing, okay, but we're going to explore why I use a box chart, okay? So, a box chart shows outliers. A bar chart does not. And I'll show you what I mean by this. Box chart shows variation. If you've ever done math GCSE, you will see that you've got the 70, 75th quartile, the 25th, the minimum, and the maximum values. You can see variation. And we can see the minimum and maximum concentrations needed. So, I'm going to explain this all in one go about why we use box charts and not bar graphs. So here's what a box chart looks like, and here is an example of the data. So let's let's look at this a bit. Okay, so um, I begin to see that the volume needed is a bit lower. Okay, I can significantly see that it is a bit lower compared to my control variable, but some readers, as you guys may say, well, well, hang on, this is a bit useless because, you know, the minimum value is over there and my maximum value is overlapping. So is it significant? Is there a point in this new drug called um, droparoid? I don't know, right? But what you begin to realise is that, okay, maybe it's not as significant as it might need to be. If I didn't see that and that, if I didn't see those two values, the minimum and the maximum values, then I would have made a different conclusion. Remember, this is about drug concentration. This is important, this is important business, you know? I need to know the exact value. If I had a large spread, how will it be ensured that the patient will fall asleep? And we'll begin to explore this a little bit more. But um, I, want you to, I want to point out something called the, the little star. What do you think a star might mean? Yeah, you seem like you want to say something. Uh, not the anomaly, sadly not. <laughs> so the star actually repre represents significant difference. Significant difference to what? The control. So, um, this is things you're going to study in biology, right? They're between biology or even maths as well. The star represents significant difference. So authors like to compare between the control and their value, right? And the only way they're going to be happy is if the um, drug concentration is significantly different. And they'll use a statistical test. They'll be like, okay, well, I've calculated this and I found out that these two are very significantly different. I'm gonna put a little star on it to show that it does represent that, okay? And what it is, is that they are 95% confident. Not 100%, 95% confident, right? Which means 5%, they're not very confident. But I want you to ensure that just because they're 95% confident, and just because there's a little star on it, doesn't mean that you should be like, good one offers, I agree with you. No, 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 you need to question it. Maybe, maybe there's something that you disagree with. Maybe you aren't happy about them overlapping between one another. Therefore, you may want to check different studies. Maybe you want to check more studies. But I want you to bear in mind that just because a p-value, and just because there's a little star there saying that, oh, they are significantly different, question yourself, could it be different? Could the, could the control and the drug be different to one another? Who knows? So there you go. Even if this threshold value, this random value was passed, doesn't mean it's not true. Maybe those two values are too different to one another. Quiz number three. A visual analog scale is a tool to measure pain intensity. Surgeons wanted to assess the VAS of patients post-operatively, right? But of the different anesthetic drugs from 0 to 15 minutes, what would you use? Oh, sorry about that. Go on. Bargraph. Yes, you use the bargraph for this. Okay? So, why not a box chart? Okay, well, remember, um, they felt like using a bargraph this time because why does it matter if one person felt one on the scale? I'm more concerned about the person who clicks four on the scale that they're feeling more intense pain. I don't really care about the outliers. There are some people experiencing 
big pain. We can use whiskers to show standard deviation. You guys know what that is? No, don't worry about it, right? But standard deviation is just, what is it, Zayn? Yeah, how much it deviates from the mean? Right, so I can, I can use that to assess, right? Maybe there is an overlap. Maybe there's, a, uh, there's an overlap between the two bar graphs. Once again, significant difference can uh, play a big role in this. So here's an example of the bar chart. See, no, no stars. Maybe. So as you can see, right, there's some stars. Stars means significant difference. The two values have a significant difference between one another, right? That one's going to be different from the control, blah, 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 for little stars. But once again, question the data. Look, this thing's overlapping with this one. Maybe there isn't significant difference. Maybe that, maybe this drug, um, nephropam, may not be useful at all. But who knows? That's what you, you're going to come up with. Another thing as well is that the x-axis and the y-axis starts from zero. And why I like to point this out to you is because they like to put this into interviews as well. And sometimes they don't put the graph starting from zero. They like to mess with your head, right? So you have to question yourself, why are they not starting from zero? Maybe, maybe that they don't have data for zero. Maybe right, they're trying to hide something away from you. So every time you see a graph like this, just look at the x-axis and y-axis. Maybe you might conclude something from that as well. So once again, we're gonna compare box plots and bar charts. Now I want you to notice, okay? Take um, this here, oops, sorry, the box plot, okay? Now I, just, I want you to focus on this bar chart, first of all, just focus on the bar chart. Look at this, two means are the same, standard deviations are the same, okay? If I was to compare drug A and drug B, you'd be like, there's no difference between drug A and drug B. I'll pick either of them, it's fine, it's okay. Now I come to my box plot. My box plot is saying something different. My box plot here is saying that there's so many outliers from here, I will never know if my drug is gonna work or not. Even though the means are the same, it does not matter because somehow this drug is failing me completely. It's saying there's so many outliers, there's so many minimum concentration needed. This one's not doing so well. Look, look, at, look at the maximum value over there. There's a value over there, some outliers as well included over here. So you begin to see that this bar chart is not representative at all. It's not telling me what's, what's happening. It's, it's like it's hiding it, you know? It's like some kind of like wall or something, right? It's hiding all these values, but I need to know. Imagine you had a drug, okay, and you had, and this one was the one failing and you were presented with this bar graph, you'd be happy to inject that into somebody. So, it tends to be that box plots are better for drug concentrations. Why did you use the bar graph for the other one? It's because, right, it doesn't matter if there's outliers, there were some people, right, experiencing high pain. And if the people are experiencing high pain at the mean, why does it matter if there's outliers? The mean shows quite a lot of information compared to the drug concentration. So here's some arrows, okay, uh, to show you the, what the whiskers are and what the individual points on the outliers. So lots of questioning to yourself. Drugs, uh, sorry not drugs, graphs can be misrepresentative. Where's number four? Dr. Vedant um, wants to present data of the different systolic, diastolic, mean blood pressures and heart rate for, the, for people with different comorbidities. What is he going to use to represent this data? Not you, I'm gonna make, no you wait. I want other people at the back. Say that again? It's not a line plot. Is it? It's not a scan graph. It's not a histogram. Pie chart. It's not a pie chart. Yeah, it's table pre re presentation. Okay. <laughs> so, so these people have different comorbidities, right? And that's the thing I just want you to look at. They have different comorbidities. I'm not assessing over a different amount of time, or I'm not assessing over like um, years or, or, or anything, right? I'm just saying that, okay, I have this and I have that, okay? I imagine you had to design, once again, another drug, okay? And this drug for a certain comorbidity. The, and this drug is to increase heart rate. What if that person already has an increased heart rate? You wouldn't give them a drug to increase the heart rate, you want to lower it, don't you? 
So you, you, you just want to see values, okay? You just want to see specific values, because all these values matter. And they're going to matter for this drug. So that's why we put it into table presentation, because it's not about identifying trends. No, 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 there's no trends. There's no years. There's no nothing. I just want to pick data. And those data is going to help me, because they might be used for something else. They're not going to show me something, but me as a researcher who sees this and believes that da their data is fine, I'm going to be like, yeah, he's, he's quite useful. I'm going to use this for my research. I may want to increase that, um, my myogenic cardiac muscles to go, or whatever, right? So that is why we use table presentation. See, this is hard, you know? You guys got it all wrong for the first one, but it's fine. We learn. So let's explore a bit of um, some examples of the data formatting. Once again, look, some table presentation. You know, I, I just picked the data, I'm like this, yeah, thank you. And I, I, I head off, right? There's a stacked bar graph. Maybe you can observe some trends in this, you know? And in here, we've got some different colors as well. Notice how they use like this big top red here to signify something quite uh, significant in here. And Here's another graph. This is called Kaplan-Meier's curve. Do you know what Kaplan-Meier's curve is, or have you guys ever seen it in your life? No, no. So, Kaplan-Meier's curve is looks at some of it looks to do with um, usually quality of life or um, how they um, quality of life or whether they survive over the treatment. So, let's say I um, introduce. Uh, let's let's take an example. Okay. Um, Okay, two surgeries, okay? The first surgery was done in a very hospitalized environment, you know, they give you grapes after surgery, and the other one was conducted outside in the forest, I stab you with a needle and I bring out your heart, okay? So, what Kevin Meyer's curve looks like, you have, a lot, you have two populations, the person who gets the intervention, the, per, the control, and the intervention B as well. Over time, they begin to plot the populations. They're like, okay, we start, we're starting from one, okay? One is where everybody survives. Happy days, right? Zero. Start at zero, times zero, okay? Later on, 100 months later, how much has that population survived after that intervention? Okay, this much has survived. If we look at the blue line, more people survived than compared to red over the same time period. And once again, we assess it again and again and again over time, right? Using a large population. And we begin to produce this curve. And what we begin to see is that blue tends to be um, more successful. Blue tends to show me that people survive longer, right, when compared to red. But uh, the issue is there's, there's a large uncertainty, you know? Why, why would people stay in the study for a, a hundred months, perhaps, or maybe like a hundred days? So, some just do not care. Some are like, well, I don't want to assess this anymore, right? So we have to get, get rid of some people as well. Some people get another intervention as well. Some people are just uncooperative. They don't, they don't listen, they don't care, right? So we'll never know the exact time of death, which means we have to remove them from the study. And one of the biggest things is called a quality of life or a one quality adjusted life year. So we would use a Kaplan-Meier curve to show them, okay, um, Mr. Mr. Zaid, okay, it shows me that this intervention, me doing it in the hospital, is better than me doing it outside, right? And perhaps the person will be more convinced if you don't show them a graph, but actually put it into words. Because you know from the data, or from the evidence data being given to you, this is more useful than this. So I'm gonna suggest that to my patients. I'm not gonna say that you wanna do it outside. So, let's begin to look at some others. The next one is called a forest plot. This is, I can't lie, right? This is weird. And a forest plot, okay, looks at not one study, but multiple study. It's called a meta-analysis, okay? So let's say I found a study, right? I'm like, mm, I don't know, right? You can look at a meta-analysis, which is a giant report that looks at everything, and then they make a, um, a conclusion. Is the control less useful when compared to the actual drug. And you, you begin to see on the graph, see, look, um, you, you might not see, right? But this side here favors, this part here favors the control. Favors the drug, favors the control, okay? 
you begin to see from their blue lines how they plot it, what um, some what papers say that they like the drug or prefer the drug or favour the drug than compared to the control. You can see the weightings of the paper. Perhaps you like this this one paper because it has the largest weighting out of all of them, so you go to that paper um, exclusively. After they assess everything, they finally make that conclusion at the end, right? And you begin to see that black dot over here. Takes account all the data. Don't worry about statistics and the maths, right? But once you can see, there's a black spot over here, and it shows you that's where it is. Of course, you as a reader have to assess is the weighting significant? That's what we've got to do. Is the weighting significant? And d does this show me something? Is this, is this useful? So, forest plots, you're going to use, usually find them in meta analysis. And they're quite helpful. Provided you just read the graph and say, that, is it favoring this side or that side? And once again, you still have that standard deviation 95% confidence, 5% they're not very confident at all. So, that's a forest plot. Here's some information compared over different studies, comparison of the treatment to the placebo, you can see the weight value, the weight of the papers, is, it, is, the, is, the, is the paper have any significant weight, and the horizontal axis that determines absolute difference, determine whether do I prefer the treatment or do I not prefer the treatment. Does anybody have any questions over the previous things I've discussed? No? Lovely. Okay, because on to our last one, our most favorite one, but the most simplest one out of all of them. This is a flow chart. Basically, or essentially, right, since we have such little time left, it's extremely popular to show what they do in a clinical trial. You wouldn't show in bullet points what they do in each part, right? You would just say that in A, we looked at this number of people. Then we looked at this, right? We recorded the duplicates removed, and we got an end sample. Then we screened them, then we did this, then we did that. The end represents the number of people. By me just showing you this flow chart, it looks nicer, it looks more visual, than me just putting it into bullet points. Visualize the number of participants in the trial, and that is it. So, those are the three goals I want you to follow from it, and interpret them independently, biggest thing in the world. To see measures of uncertainty, so you 